He went through basically almost, you know, uh, century by century and even decade by decade going back through. And, you know, we're, we, we, we tend to look at the world in terms of where we are at this particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, we see everything as being, you know, our, our, our time is the time. Yeah. And any generation before that said the same thing that, you know, they, they saw the same thing. They, you know, they, they didn't have any connection, any real connection with other generations. What they did have, of course, is what they, what, what they read in, in textbooks. And we're, we're the same way. We just, we think we're special. We think we're special individually. We think yeah. we're special nationally. And we think we're special uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, in terms of time. So I don't think I don't think that in and of itself is unusual. Uh, that's just I think that's just the way it is. And so uh, people have taken scripture passages that are being taken today and they've applied them to their day because there are a lot of common elements in all of this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. I've got a returning guest, my first returning guest, Gary DeMar. I've been talking about the rapture and the mark of the beast and what that looks like. Uh, was that something in the past, in the present, in the future? All three. Um, go ahead and like and subscribe. It helps the algorithm out. It really does. Um, if you don't like it, I guess, then you know, don't like it. Don't just do it because I ask you to. But it does. If you do like it, please uh, like uh, and share it if you do get some benefit from it. The whole point of these is to be a little more serious, talking about a little more theological issues, cultural things, and so on. So like uh, if you do like it and subscribe if you haven't already. That's free. You know, It doesn't cost anything. And I won't charge you a dime, I promise. <clears throat> but watch the whole thing before you form an opinion about it. This is more of a controversial issue. It's not the prevailing uh, issue, at least not uh, Gary DeMar's view. It's, it's more of a minority view here in the church currently. Um, but we should always be seeking to renew our minds, always seeking to sharpen iron, sharpening iron, and so on. So watch it, the whole thing, before you form an opinion. That would be wonderful. And uh, comment. And uh, let's let's talk. All right. Enjoy the conversation. I've got my first returning guest, Gary Demar. Uh, we're going to be talking more about end times, and more particularly the rapture and the mark of the beast. So I encourage you to check out. I've got another end times um, hour plus long conversation between Gary and me, and uh, or Gary and I, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's up here somewhere. I'll put up the link. So again, welcome back to the show, Gary Demar. Well, thanks for having me back at yeah. this late hour as I'm getting older. 10 o'clock in the evening for me is bedtime. So <laughs> I know I hear you. I, I appreciate you staying up late. The children, children don't uh, make for good background noise. So they're all asleep right now. Um, well, we we touched on quite a few things last time. Um, like I said, I'd encourage other people to, to get that. Um, but there's so many more so many more things, right? I mean, there's just so many different things that are prevailing um, in the church, in the culture. It's, it's really, it's hard to even tackle it in a book or in a series of books and certainly not in an hour or two or three conversation, right? And I think it's anytime you have deep theological questions or just questions in general, it takes a long time. So I appreciate those tuning in. Um, but two things that have kind of, I don't want to say bothered me, but definitely caught my interest, uh, especially as of late, you know, mandatory vax. I don't know. People are weird with the getting monetized or bothered vaccine saying the word. I don't know. But man, being being forced with the jab, right? You have to do this. And some people, oh, it's the mark of the beast. Oh, well, it's not the mark of the beast, but it's, it's, gonna, it's a precursor to it. Uh, you can't buy or sell. You can't do this. You can't do that. And then, of course, secondly, there's even more importantly, the rapture, right? We're just, we're just waiting. You just come on, Jesus, you know, almost, almost cultish for some people where they drink in the Kool-Aid, you got the Haley's Comet people and all sorts of, this is, everybody has an eschatology. You've said that. And those two kind of prevailing things, especially in the last 18 months of, of all the nonsense that's happened, good, bad, and otherwise, a lot of Christians and a lot of even just the world are like, yeah, this is it. Premillennial dispensational. That's just the lay of the land. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And people are, you know, reading the stones and the stars and whatever they're doing. And they're always wrong. <laughs> I've heard you say that. And I've heard others say that's like, you know, predicting the end times when Jesus is coming back. 100% of the time they've been wrong. 
for centuries, right? It's not new. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. In fact, we published a book called The Day and the Hour uh, by Francis Gummerlock, and he went through basically almost, you know, uh, century by century and even decade by decade going back through. And, you know, we're, we, we, we tend to look at the world in terms of where we are at this particular time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see everything as being, you know, our, our, our time is the time. Yeah. And a- any generation before that said the same thing that, you know, they, they saw the same thing. They, you know, they, they didn't have any connection, any real connection with other generations. What they did have, of course, is what they, what, what they read in, in textbooks. And we're, we're the same way. We just, we think we're special. We think we're special individually. We think yeah. we're special nationally. And we think we're special uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, in terms of time. Mm-hmm. So I don't think, I don't think that in and of itself is unusual. Uh, that's just, I think that's just the way it is. And so uh, people have taken scripture passages that are being taken today and they've applied them to their day because there are a lot of common elements in all of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, t- t- tyranny isn't anything new. Uh, I mean, you go back to the first century and you see the, you know, the Roman Empire. Here you find the last chapter of the book of Acts. Paul is in, uh, he's in a it's kind of a nice prison. He's under on, under house arrest. And we know, uh, we, we, you know we, there was executions. I mean, Stephen was executed and uh, John, uh, uh, John, the brother of James, was, was, was executed by one of the Herods. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul, you know, describes the, the, the many persecutions, uh, tribulations, uh, whippings that he had. So, you know, uh, we think, well, homosexuality, well, it's all, almost a full chapter in Romans chapter one on homosexuality. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you find it in first Corinthians chapter six, you see it in first Timothy chapter, chapter one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- th- these things aren't unusual in terms of their ethical morale, of, of, you know, their, their, their ethical uh, uh, standards. What's, I think what's different about it today is the communication factor. Here, look, look what we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is you know, no one who, you know, back then who considered such a thing. We get news at it in an instant, and this, the piling on of news is, is you know, something that we've never had before. When I was I was growing up, I, I was born in 1950. You had three TV stations. You had ABC, CBS, and NBC. And we couldn't get NBC because we had a poor signal. Those were the days <laughs> where everything came over the air. So I never saw an episode of Star Trek or Bonanza oh, wow. because they were on NBC. Okay. Uh, but think about you know today what we're doing here and and streaming. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's it's. A, a brave new world, as as Huxley, you know, you painted it. Now, having said that, just like anything else, it can be used for good, and you can be used for evil. What we're doing right now with this technology, we're no one ever, you know, talked about. Uh, you know, Paul goes on a ship in order to talk to people in, in Asia Minor and Rome, and then he was he was uh, planning to go to Spain. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I've, I've done interviews like this you know, around the world. Uh, so the, the technology in and of itself is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And, and writing, writing back in Paul's day was you know, both for you know, good, and, good and ill. So we have, to, we have to keep all of this in, in perspective and at the same time deal with the specifics of what's taking place in our day in, t- in terms of certain biblical absolutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, that's where every, the land of fruits and nuts. I remember <laughs> Greg Bonson saying that I heard that from other people too. Um, but it's true. I mean, there's so many cults and religious sects and organizations that have started in California and, you know, Harold camping back in 20, 2011, 2012, uh, the movie 2012 and all these other things that's in my adult life. And that happened before with Joe witnesses and with these people and those people. And it's just like, guys, do you not see <laughs> these basic things that have repeated over and over and over and over again, but somehow we think we're going to be different. Right? Maybe yeah, it's that same look, logic. Well, like, yeah. World war II. Uh, you go back um, 1926, Oswald J. J. Smith wrote a book on the antichrist and he says it was Mussolini. And he lined up all of the scripture passages, which he said confirmed this. 
Now, when Mussolini was you know, finally uh, you know, a- a- executed, uh, he, Smith was embarrassed by this. And I, I read an article in a, uh, a chapter in a book where he, if he go, went to speak anywhere, he would tell people if they brought their book in, he'd, you know, he'd, pay, he'd pay them back. I've uh-huh. got a couple of copies of this, of, of, of his book. Awesome. Uh, you have the, you had, um, you can go back to the you know, French Revolution. You can go look at, you can look at uh, Nazi Germany. I mean, marking people literally with numbers on their, on their arm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is the point that needs to be made here. Uh, the, when you get to, when you get to Revelation chapter 13 and the mark of the beast and buying and selling and all the, all those sorts of things, we, we take the position that it's not relevant unless it's, it's linked with Bible prophecy. Mm. Uh, the, these things exist outside of Bible prophecy, just like, the the uh, the Old Testament talks about the the, the rise of of, uh, of the Medes and the Persians and Medes, the Greeks and and the and the Romans and the tyrannies. They're beasts. See, they're beasts. Mm-hmm. And as a result of them being beasts, they're they they're they're going to be tyrants. Uh, you don't need a you don't need Bible prophecy to to tell you that there are tyrants in the world. You don't have to go to a particular verse in the Bible and say that this guy is a tyrant. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't have to do that with Adolf Hitler. You didn't have to do it with Mussolini. You didn't have to do it with Stalin. You didn't have to do it with Lenin. You didn't, you didn't have to do it with any of those things. There are no specific Bible verses that tell us that, that uh, those particular individuals were tyrants. How do we know that they were tyrants? Because they are acting like tyrants. Mm-hmm. And we have a description of that, of course, in, in Scripture, uh, so we can make that moral evaluation just in terms of what Scripture says about you know, governmental leadership getting out of hand. Uh, so, you know, today with the, 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 the vaccines, uh, buying and selling, first of all, we have to come up with what, what is going on in Revelation chapter 13 about buying and selling? Mm-hmm. Um, and do you need a Bible prophecy to tell you that if a government comes in and says you won't be able to buy or sell unless you do this sort of thing, does that mean you have to have a Bible verse to tell you that? Mm. You should be able to figure that on your own in terms of what Scripture has to say and what reason tells you as well. Mm-hmm. If you live within a context of a Christian of, of a biblical worldview, you know the the idea of, of freedom and liberty and so forth. You don't need a particular Bible verse to tell you that that verse refers to that particular thing. Mm-hmm. Why don't you flesh out for a moment then? Let's just dig a little deeper on the mark of the beast and we'll look at and the rapture uh, more specifically. But since you mentioned Revelation 13, is, is that so? Most people believe Revelation was written around 90, 95, right? That's um, yeah. Mo- yeah. Most people who believe that don't haven't worked that out. That's what they've been told. Right. Well, uh, that's, and yeah, that's the same thing with me. And I was listening to some of your content and a couple of different conferences you all did through the Canon app several months ago. Um, I was working on the house and I had a bunch of time. So I was listening to a bunch of stuff and you didn't say it. Nobody said it. I forget how many other speakers there were, but I was just thinking, I was like, I think Revelation was written before <laughs> 70 yeah. AD, you know? And it's like, uh, so if, wait, if that's the case and, and this is actually predicting as as a lot of a lot of things that you've said and others who believe that that it's actually much earlier, then that actually fits a lot better because I think a lot of people have these presuppositions as we all do for all sorts of things. But when you kind of turn it on its head and say, "Well, what if it's this?" then I feel like that opens up a whole new can of worms. So, what's the Revelation thirteen, the buying and selling? Did that already happen? Is that something still in our future? Is that just kind of a a general a tyrant's going to come in? He's going to be a, a jerk. And he's going to ruin people's lives. What's what's going on there? Uh, what, I think the, the first thing you have to come up with is a a hermeneutical methodology. What is the what's the what's the biblical approach to interpreting the Bible? Where, how how should you go about doing that? Um, and it, Greg Bond, you mentioned Greg Bonson. Greg Bonson talked about newspaper exegesis. 
where people would use the newspaper as kind of a filter, a grid by which to interpret the Bible. So they would find something that took place in the news. And of course, it's hard to tell. It's, to today, it's internet exegesis. You know, yeah. People on the, on the internet are, are t- 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 talking, uh, saying all these things. And so what you need to do is let the, the, the Bible needs to speak with it for itself. And what you need to do is to compare scripture with scripture. And so let's just look at the book of Revelation, for example. Yes, the dating is important. Uh, even though a late date wouldn't exclude uh, uh, its, its principial approach because an idealist doesn't need a particular time in which the book of Revelation was written because the, the book of Revelation is all about certain I- ideas mm-hmm. that are applicable in principle. Mm-hmm. Now, but all scriptures like that, just because a, pro- a prophecy, prophecy has been fulfilled doesn't mean it doesn't have any application anymore. Right. Now that's just that's just ridiculous. So when so the early dating of the Book of Revelation comes down to a couple of things. The, the the Book of Revelation begins with the very first verse talks about how these things are you know soon to come to pass. Right. In verse in, in verse three of chapter one says the time is near. Now what people do say oh yeah but with 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 God time t- time is nebulous it doesn't it's very it's it's not very specific. That's that's just nonsense. Mm-hmm. Uh, if 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 you and I I've done this already, and others can do it too. Uh, look up every use of the the, the 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 Greek words translated near and shortly and quickly and at hand in in Scripture and see how they are used throughout the Bible. Uh, well, since we're dealing with Greek, so in without throughout the New Testament. So you can't go to uh, a passage in Revelation 1, 3, where it says the time is near and say there near means, well, it, it, it just means that whenever something is going to happen, it will happen. And if you go to other places in scripture where that, that word is used, you could never apply that interpretation to it. So mm-hmm. you can't have a hundred places where near means near in terms of time or place. And then in a couple of places, because it deals with prophecy, it doesn't mean that. Mm-hmm. And they'll go to you know, Second uh, Peter chapter three, uh, verse I think it's verse eight. We're about you know with uh, with the Lord a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And so there, there you go, right there. See, so you can take near and it can be a thousand years. That's not what it says. It doesn't say it's not right. the way you can you do this because which would mean anytime you see the word thousand or which a day, you can make it say anything. Yeah. Well, That's people do that with the beginning of two. They'll they'll trash Genesis when they do that all the time. Oh, yes. It's, oh, yeah. it says maybe it's billions of years. And you're like, eh, no, but okay. So, anyway, uh, but, you know, but the number thousand is a symbolic number, but near is not a symbolic number. Right. We have cases in the Bible where thousand is a symbolic number. One day with the uh, one day with uh, with the Lord is better. One day in the court of the Lord is better than a thousand oh, days else. anywhere else. Yeah. Oh, so if I have a one thousand and one days. <laughs> That's better than one yeah. day in the court of the Lord. Or God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, maybe there are more than a thousand hills, so God doesn't own those cattle. So the number 1,000 is a symbolic number. How do we know that? It's used in the Bible that way. But mm. near and shortly and quickly in this generation, or Jesus says in, in Matthew 24, 34, this generation will not pass away and all these things take place. Those mm. things are not used symbolically. They are used in what someone might say is literally. So the events described in the book of Revelation are said to be near. So, and, and then John says that he is a, a fellow partner in the tribulation. So this tribulation was going on during John's day. And he says he's a fellow partaker in it. Mm. So that gives you some indication wow, of what's yeah. going on. Then you have uh, seven individual churches that were in existence at that particular period of time. And, and see, again, to get away, get around this, they say, oh, but those seven churches represented, represent seven ages. Right. And we're in the Laodicean age. But again, you're importing something into the text that isn't there. Jesus is, is, Jesus is bringing uh, a, a discerning uh potential judgment upon these churches if they don't get their act together. 
He's not bringing it on a particular ages. He's bringing it to those particular churches that were in existence at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And we, we know, and we know that this is that particular period of time because in revelation two, nine and three, nine, he talks about the synagogue of Satan, which were, were probably apostate Jews who opposed, opposed Jesus. They are the, they are the biblical antichrists. Mm -hmm. Those who deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh uh, of second John chapter seven. We know that there were many antichrists in John's day. Second, first, uh, first John chapter two, verse 18. And by this, and he says, by this, the fact that these many antichrists are here, we know that it's the last hour, mm, which yeah. means that it was this generation that Jesus had predicted was going to pass away before their generation passed away in Matthew 24, 34. It was coming to the end point of this. So that means first John, second John, uh, third, third John uh, the, were written all before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which is in fact that judgment. Then you get to chapter 11 in Revelation and the, the, the temple is still standing. Remember, John is taken up in a vision in chapter four. Mm -hmm. So he's seeing this kind of at, at the, you know, the 30,000 foot level and he's looking down and he's this, the temple is still, is, 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 is still there. Well, we know that was destroyed in AD 70. And there are other time markers. I won't go through all of these. Yeah. Um, the, the, the sixth king was alive when the book of Revelation was written. Uh, uh, Ken Gentry deals with this in his book be Before Jerusalem Fell. Now, mm -hmm. now let's get to the conditions of, of, in the book of Revelation. In chapter six, uh, yeah, chapter six of Revelation, we're told, that a third of the stars, I think it's a third of the stars, or the stars from heaven are yeah. cast down to earth. Okay, so that means in the sixth chapter, the stars are thrown down to earth, and in the twelfth chapter, the dragon with the sweep of his tail throws down a third of the stars to earth. So by the time you get to chapter 13, if you're going to take the Bible literally at this point, the earth is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have an electronic system that's going to, you know, you know, barcodes and other types of way of to, keeping track of people. But wait a minute. The earth just got destroyed in chapters 6 and 12. How in the world do you get to chapter 13 and you have this highly sophisticated uh, uh, system out there? It, it makes no sense. Yeah. So what we have to do is find the hermeneutical model here. The hermeneutical model is that scripture interpret scripture. We know in Revelation 13, there are two beasts. There is a sea beast and a land beast. The sea beast, now beasts in scripture typically describe governments and governments that are tyrannies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and so in Revelation chapter 13, you find beasts. But in Revelation 14, you find the lamb. And by the way, the lamb has a mark too. You're mm -hmm. marked with, with, with the lamb. So whatever the type of mark this is, it has to be also attributed to the lamb. Hmm. And so if the mark of the beast is, is somehow some vaccination that you're going to take or some barcode or some, uh, uh, some sort of chip that's embedded into you, well, then you got to say the same thing about the, 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 the mark of the lamb in chapter 14, which, make, mm. again, makes no sense. So let's stick to what Scripture says. So let's yeah. look at buying and selling. Where in Scripture does, where else in Scripture is buying and selling mentioned? Now, this is, it might be a good you know, trivia a, a question mm. one night. Where else in the Bible does it say about buying and selling and what is the buying and selling attributed to? Well, remember in, in Matthew chapter 21. Now, Matthew 21, chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24, they're all a lead up to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 wow. about the destruction of Jerusalem. It's mm. all a lead up. When you get to chapter 21, you find you know, Jesus, the, the Mount of Olives is mentioned there, and Jesus comes in on a donkey and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Jesus goes into the temple, and he, he goes into the temple, and this is the second time he goes into the temple. Now, the, the Old Testament talks about leprosy, leprosy of a house. And how do you determine whether or not le there's leprosy of a house? A priest makes an evaluation of the house, and he inspects it two times. 
Hmm. And if the leprosy is still there on the second time, what do you do to the house? You tear it down, completely tear it down. So if you go back to John chapter, John's gospel, Jesus goes to the temple the first time. Well, you get to uh, Matthew chapter 21, Jesus goes to the temple a second time and evaluates it. And what were they doing in the temple? Mm. They were buying and selling. So buying and telling is linked to worship. Yeah. It's linked to the temple. And in order for you to get into the temple, you had to go through these money changers and they gave you access. So you get to Revelation chapter three and buying and selling there is, is identified with worship. It's not dealing with commerce in the usual sense. It's dealing with the issue of worship because the whole book of Revelation is about worship. Mm. It's all about worship. Who are you going to worship? Who's in charge? Who's, who are you going to worship? It was the same thing in the gospel. is isn't anything different. So I think Revelation 13, you, what you see here is Rome, uh, the, the sea beast, and, and, and Israel, the land beast, and the leadership of those two going up against the, 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 the church. This is kind of the end point of what's going to happen lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, re, re, remember that when Jesus was crucified, the... The, the, the leadership, the Jewish leadership, uh, cast a curse upon themselves. Uh, mm, let, this yeah, be, right. let this be upon us and our children yeah, that's right. for doing this. See, this makes much more, much more sense. It makes better sense than trying to fit this into a modern day you know, technological system. Mm -hmm. If you stick with what scripture has to say about these issues, this makes it makes much more sense. It, it's look, it's it's not as jazzy, um, right? But it's biblical. It's you know, yeah. I, I've stuck. I haven't I haven't quoted anybody. I haven't looked at any newspaper. All I've done is I've gone to scripture and let scripture determine for me what those phrases mean, <clears throat> and trying to fit it in with that with that context. Mm -hmm. But what we want to do, we want a, a a kind of a gee whiz bang up end time prophetic system we can get our people all worked up that this is this is all evidence that the rapture the rapture of the church is right around the corner right and that's you know it's uh, to me it, it makes a mockery of the bible yeah no i mean it really does and i think it's uh, more and more recently especially but just i think probably my whole christian life the last decade or so i just so often people whether it's a cult that just are like yeah this guy said he's jesus so i'm gonna go with him and you're like hold on hold on hold on have you read your bible lately like you know or just believing just the most random and off the cuff weird thing like yeah i guess we can do this in church it's like did you even cite any scripture of like why we're now doing this and not that you know like people just don't know their bibles at all i mean and i would be one of them i mean i, I every time i read i'm just like man i need to read this more and it's just it, the if you have the attitude of I'm good. I've read the Bible. That's the wrong attitude to have. I mean, I've heard you say it and you just said it now, like take what's, what is being familiar with the culture of who's writing. And then you need to, like you just said, let the Bible interpret the Bible. It's so yeah. quote unquote, yeah, oh, look, it's so profound, the, yeah, the, but it's, yeah, it's so thing, basic, the, right? Yeah. The thing is the Bible was written to a particular group of people at a particular period of time. It doesn't mean it doesn't have any application to us today. Yeah. But it's 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 a story that's being told about that time. I, I was just today, my, my uh, uh, Eric Rauch, he and I do a podcast together, and mm. he showed me a video of a woman. I guess it, she was on some Christian conference, and she was talking about Monster Energy drinks. Oh yeah, and I don't know if you've ever seen a Monster a Energy little, drink yeah, the... with the three claw marks on it. Yeah, is and, it a Hebrew or something? And well, it's like yeah, six the, the or sixth like letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Vav. Mm -hmm. And so he, and those claws look like a Vav. Mm -hmm. okay. So, but, here, but here's somebody who can't, is really unfamiliar with the Bible. And, uh, and she's you know, looking at something that the 99.9% .9 of the people in the world wouldn't have any idea that that looks like a vol. But let's assume it looks like a vol. Let's yeah. assume that it's meant to be 
a Vav, the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Here's the problem with that. The, the mark of the beast, the number of the beast, is not three sixes. If you were to write that in Hebrew, 666, it would not be three Vavs. Mm -hmm. Only one of them, the, the, the third letter, would be a six, it would, which would be the sixth letter of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. And the same with, 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 with Greek. Uh, you could, the Greek, Greek letters were often were, were used for numbers. Hebrew letters are used for numbers. And so that's not 666, that, which, by the way, is the number of the beast. It is 666. They are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, But what, what she has done is she's looking under every rock and under every crevice to try to come up with a sensationalistic way of getting people's attention about the end times. And that connection doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's something that just stands out on its own. And the question, you know, of course, her thing is, this is all about Satan. And if you, if you, if you drink a monster drink, there's, I guess it looks like an upside down cross is on there. And she's just importing all this stuff in, in, in about, about what we're living in the last days. Yeah. And I, it wasn't too long ago. I remember a, a woman uh, wrote a book about this, about barcodes, barcodes were the, were the, were the big, big thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at some barcodes, there were three bars, on one on the left, one in the middle, one on the right. Supposedly each one of those was six. That's six, six, six. And yet that's still, that's still um, the, that doesn't have the number. And what's, what's the newest thing today? Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, this, let's see if I can get this on here. Yeah, th th this oh, this QR is a new one. Code, yeah, yeah, QR. yeah. The Q, what, what's it called? A Q QR QR code. Yeah. So I'm waiting. There's got to be some some way. This is lined up with the mark of the beast. Yeah. So you heard it here first. <laughs> Let me know if you come across somebody who sees this as the mark of the beast. And let's look. Let's look at this. I've just picked this up. Yeah. Okay. I've just picked it up. You see the three squares, mm, and then yeah. you see a white square and a ding, black ding. square in there, and there are three of them, and each one of those represents the six. And so if I turn it this way, I turn it this way, uh-oh, six, six, six. And uh, so anyway, so yeah. I, no, I mean, you can do anything. I mean, it's like statistics. You can prove anything you want with, with numbers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I did this. Really in fact, I I I I wrote the I I ought to revive this article. I wrote an, a satirical article. I took all of this type of type of stuff and I printed it. And a, a fellow came up to me and he says, "You know, Gary, I, I know you wrote this as satire, but it, a lot of people would, in fact, you know, be, it sounds reasonable to them if they're thinking, you know, like." barcodes and monster energy drinks, drinks and QR codes and, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just, a, a, this is a, a amazing. We, we, we do this to ourselves and yet if you just stick with the text of scripture. Time is near. These things must shortly take place. Yeah. Develop or take her in the tribulation. Seven historical churches at that particular period of time. This temple still standing in Revelation uh, ch uh, chapter 11. Uh, you know, devastated earth if, if stars fell to the earth in Revelation 6 and Revelation chapter, chapter 12. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 mark, the mark of the beast, the mark of the lamb, they have to be the same thing. Why, why one for one and not one for the other? Mm -hmm. you, and you, you know, buying and selling, where else is buying and selling found? And then the other question is, where else do you find the number 666 in the Bible? This is, this is an interesting thing as well. Hmm. Uh, and again, this 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 one is not um, unique to me. I didn't I didn't come up with this. I've got a good friend who's a literary genius when it comes to literature, and the Bible is in fact literature. Mm -hmm. And if you go to First Kings chapter ten, First Kings chapter ten, it is a description of everything a a king in Israel was not supposed to do. And Solomon disobeyed the laws regarding kingship. 
the number of horses, the military men, you know, even the chariots that he has. The, a king of Israel was not supposed to accumulate these things. Now, the numbers that are used there are round numbers. They're all round numbers except mm. for one. One number is not a round number, and it's 666, which is kind of curious. Yeah. And so what happens in the very next chapter? Solomon marries these women of the nations. One, again, another thing a king was not permitted to do. And they, they, they lead him away from the faith. And so what we find in the, in, in the say, the book of Acts is the, the, the Jews initially trying to, well, in, in the Gospels, aligning themselves with Rome. What did they say in, in John chapter 19, verse 15? We have, we no, have king no king but Caesar. Yeah. Give us Caesar. Yeah, so you 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 put all this stuff together, and it's a good possibility that 666 is really referring to kind of a Solomon's, you know, apostasy, and with the Jews, you know, going after the Christians and the Romans, then coming in there and and you, God uses them as an instrument to bring judgment upon an a, a, apostate Israel. Uh, in the same way that that, uh, that 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 Solomon, you know, lost lost his kingdom by aligning himself with with the, with the pagan nations, with other that makes gods, much yeah. more sense wow. than this fantastic stuff that we're hearing today. Now, let me say again, this doesn't mean that a mandated vac vaccine is something we should dismiss. I'm just saying, look, we have pr you know principles in the scripture. We could say this can be applied. Just like anything, like during you know Hitler and any anyone else, mm. and tyrant comes along and compels us to do things. The Bible maintains that's evil. That's an evil thing. You don't need a specific Bible verse to tell you that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's I. <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, I don't know. I feel like that's more sensational and like revealing. But I guess I guess it's like the high that. I mean, you're you're not throw, you're not blown away by because you now know it, but I've never seen that six 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 as far as I mean. He, Solomon got six hundred and sixty six talents of gold yearly. It said, which is a lot of gold. Yeah, and it's a lot of said, gold. The yeah. next year, he he or the next chapter, he's turning to other gods, yeah. and it says other women and leading him astray, which is why you know, I mean, Israel going into the promised land. Don't do this. Don't do this because you're going to follow their gods. What was Israel doing in the first century? Following other gods. We have no king but Caesar. I mean. It's so much more biblical, but I guess it kind of, I guess it dies down, right? Once you understand the Bible more clearly in these, in these uh, particular ways, then you move on to other things that, or you keep talking about it because people are so consumed with, with the opposite. But the stuff that's sensational, like a vax, like a barcode from 20 years ago, like a, what, a Hitler or a Stalin, <clears throat> it's the next thing. It's the next thing. That didn't work. Forget that. I mean, it's like what we're dealing with, with new stuff now. I mean, the debacle with Afghanistan and it's, now we're back to whatever Biden says, you know, and yeah, he totally biffed it big time and people have died, but who cares about that? You know, like we're just moving to the very oh, next yeah. thing on the news just yes. to just, you know, the little shiny thing. Look over here, people. Yeah. Um, and again, wow. again, this isn't anything new. Keep, keep in mind <laughs> that not. Josephus, it's not. Uh, Josephus was a Jew uh, who went over to the Roman side and wrote now, he wrote a kind of a defense of, of, of Israel, history of Israel, mm -hmm. but he was writing for Rome. He was writing for Rome and he was, you know, to the, vic you know, the, it's the victors that write the history books. Yeah. And so propaganda isn't anything new either. Uh, this, the Caesars were bad people. I mean, come on. This is like, this, this isn't, this, this doesn't take a Bible scholar. It doesn't take a seminary graduate or someone, a PhD Mm -hmm. To figure this, these things out, if you follow the biblical connections and stick with them, or you go the other route. The other route is, well, what we have to do is make a distinction between Israel and the church. We're going to have to have a rebuilt temple, even though the New Testament doesn't say anything about a rebuilt temple. We have to put a gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, then we have to find, find in there that the, uh, the Antichrist makes a covenant with the Jews and then breaks the, breaks the covenant with the Jews. And then there's going to be an end time guy call, called the uh, uh, Antichrist who's going to rule the world. And there's not a single verse that supports any of those conclusions. They're not there. You will not find 
the 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 antichrist mentioned in in Daniel chapter chapter nine. In fact, what's what's interesting about all of this is that uh, you know supposedly the church is not mentioned. This is the thing: church is not mentioned in the uh, uh, in, in the Old Testament. Well, if you have a gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel, and the 70th week of Daniel hasn't happened yet, and that gap is mentioned in the Old Testament, that gap is the church. Mm-hmm. So the very thing that dispensationalists say is not found un- under the in the Old Testament, it's 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 there. It's it's it's, it's between it's the time between the 69th and the 70th week. Wow. But you know, d- dispensationalism uh, is just all kinds of ways to try to get a, get around the, the clear statements of, of, of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, but David Jeremiah, who's a pastor, I don't know if he's in Tennessee or not. Uh, uh, so someone accused me of being preoccupied with eschatology. And so I, I, I went online to find David Jeremiah, and he's got like 10 books on Bible prophecy. And H1 is, is, is more sensational than the next one. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and everything that he's saying about Bible prophecy people have said before, just in different ways and in different, in, you know, in, in different, in different people. Uh, there, these I, I have a library full of all these sensationalistic books. I mean, the, the big book of the 1970s was Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. Yeah, I have a copy and, of that. <laughs> yeah, th- now think about I've not it. Read it, but yeah, that that was that that book was written uh, more than 50 years ago. Mm. That means if someone is listening to this, is 50 years old, you were you were just you were a year old. You were you were a year old. You had no conception of what anything was going going on. So, fifty you know fifty years ago, and Hal Lindsey, you know, he didn't come right out and say you know Jesus is going to return before nineteen eighty eight. But he was pretty. He wouldn't have sold that book if he hadn't made this kind of prediction where he maintained because Israel became a nation again in nineteen forty eight. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. A generation is 40 years. You had 40 in 1948. You get 1988. And people were, during the 1980s, uh, Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith was another one who followed the same scheme. Mm -hmm. But Lindsay's book was written 51 years ago. And here we have prophecy writers today doing the same thing, doing the same thing that how Lindsay did 50 years ago. Wow. And then there were those uh, there were those going all the way back through history who did the same thing with the same Bible verses. But all yeah. I know, today's different. Today's different. You know, everything is moving in this in this particular direction. Now, what we see today, I think what we're really seeing today is the the outworking of unbelieving worldviews. And as the outworking of these uh, these unbelieving worldviews to become more and more consistent with themselves. Mm. And it's forcing us to choose sides. And it was the same thing in the book of Acts. Essentially, what you find in the preaching in the book of Acts was choose a side. Mm -hmm. And what's happening today, people are being forced to choose a side. Now, we may, not enough people may choose a side, the right side. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean the rapture's around the corner because during Nazi Germany, people chose the wrong side. During the Russian Revolution, they chose chose the wrong side. During the French Revolution, they chose the wrong side. Mm. Uh, It it doesn't mean that there's it's an eschatological event. It means that we're going to go through a a heck of a you know problem if we don't fix this. But Christians are so preoccupied and think they're going to be raptured out of here that they don't. They just see this as a prophetic inevitability, and they're not interested in trying to change things because they say these things can't be changed. Yeah. Yeah. Flesh that out a little bit then. Um, so Mark of the Beast, I think that's that's very, that's really good. Thank you for that. Um, but the rapture, right? I mean, again, I, I remember I was working. I think I mentioned it before somewhere. Um, and me and another Christian girl, we were at a restaurant. This was 2011. And it was Harold Camping, Family Radio. Yeah. You probably know him and all that. And several people were like, well, we know if, you know, Gianna and Richard are gone, that it happened. You know, and like tongue in cheek. And it's like, you know, part of me in the back of my mind's like, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. 
but yeah, I don't really, I don't know. But why are we still, I mean, if you're, if, if, you if, you're, if you're Christians and if they're gone and you're a Christian, why are you still there? Right. Well, they were, they, they were saying if, if we vanish, then, then, it, then it happened. Quote, yeah. quote. So yeah. that, oh, that yeah. Harold Camping game was right. Now, of course, it didn't happen and everything else, but flesh out a little bit where, so we see the rapture in, what is it? Second Thessalonians four. That's the rapture text, right? First, first Thessalonians, first, Thess- four. Okay, first Thessalonians, Thessalonians four, 13 through 18. And, and um, where, I mean, how is that? The church has always believed that. Is that? No, no. Okay. Here, here, look, the reason the doctrine of the rapture got started is, is because dispensationalists claimed that God had, was dealing with Israel. And because Israel rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah, the prophecy clock stopped. That means Daniel's 70 weeks stopped at the 483rd year. Mm. And then now God was going to deal with a new group of people called the church. And then that God would then start dealing with Israel again. That would mean that that God would have to take the church off the earth and that would be the rapture of the church. And then after that, the final seven years of Israel, 70 weeks of years prophecy would take place. And uh, there, look, there is no logic to any of that. Uh, who, who made up, first of all, the word, the word church. Um, I commented on Facebook today in a post. If William Tyndale's, translation of the Greek word ecclesia had been followed by the translators of the King James Bible, we never would have had dispensationalism. Hmm. Because the Greek word ecclesia isn't a new word in the New Testament. The, the, The Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek uh, years before Jesus appears, appears on earth. And the Hebrew word Kahal, which is congregation or assembly, is translated in Greek as ecclesia. And if you were to pick up a Hebrew Bible, which I have, I have one, you pick up a Hebrew Bible and look up the, the places where the, the Greek word ecclesia is used, Matthew 18, uh, you know, throughout the New Testament, uh, Acts chapter f- uh, 5, verse 11, you'll see that it's it's translated as kahal. Hmm. So the, the Greek word ekklesia is not a special word at all. It simply means congregation or assembly. In fact, in Acts chapter 7, verse 38, Stephen, in his, in his speech, talks about the ekklesia in the wilderness. But wait a minute. Hmm. The, the church, the ekklesia was never mentioned, wasn't supposed to be in, 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 the, uh, in the Old Covenant. But Stephen calls... The, 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 the Jews in the wilderness, the ecclesia. You'll find the same thing in Psalm chapter 2, verse 12. So this is just a, this is a made-up argument that God created this, this new group of people called the, the ecclesia, the church, hmm. and he, he postponed the, 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 the Daniel's prophecy for, you know, for so far close to 2,000 years. For what? For what reason? What's the reason for this? So he can take the, the, the church off the earth so he can deal with Israel again? Okay, so he's going to deal with Israel again. Well, according to the dispensationalists, two-thirds of the Jews are going to be slaughtered during this seven-year period. It, again, it, 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 doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so who, who made up the, the ecclesia in the book of Acts? Who, who were they? They were Jews. Acts chapter 5, verse 11. They made up the ecclesia. Well, wait a minute. I thought the ecclesia was some new thing. It wasn't anything new. Mm. These people did. They didn't say, "Oh, what's what's this ecclesia?" They knew what the word ecclesia meant. Yeah, they were familiar with the Septuagint. There is no distinction between Israel and the church in the New Testament. Mm. The, the two words are completely they're different entities, and unbelieving unbel- Jews were part of the assembly or congregation in the ecclesia. And believing Gentiles are part of the assembly and ecclesia and congregation. And they make up, as Ephesians 2 says, one new man in Christ. And the dividing wall has been broken down. Mm. And so it was to the Jew first and then to the nations. 
And so the first members of the ecclesia in the, in the New Testament was the remnant of believing Israelites. Uh, so this, the whole system is, is rotten from, from bottom to top. Hmm. Uh, every foundation stone is, 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 is broken up. So what's going on in 1 in, in first Thessalonians chapter 4? They say that's the rapture of the church. Right. That, read it. It doesn't say anything about the rapture of the church. It doesn't say anything about a tribulation period. It doesn't say anything about an antichrist. It doesn't say anything about a seven-year period. Uh, you know, historically, that's been a passage that refers to the general resurrection. Jesus will return um, to judge the living and the dead, the quick and the dead. That's mm-hmm. what that passage generally has meant. Now, others see this as something that was very similar to what you read in Ephesians chapter 2, where it talks about that he has seated us in the heavenly places. Mm. That was a first century, first century reality. And so there are numbers of interpretations to that particular passage, but you can't turn that into a rapture passage because of all the other stuff you have to have in order to get you there. Mm-hmm. And, those, and those things don't have any passages that, that support them either. Some say you get to um, Revelation chapter 4, uh, that's the beginning of the church age because John is taken up into heaven and the word church doesn't appear again. And the, the word church appeared in uh, 19 times in the first uh, three, ch- three chapters of Revelation. Well, actually, the, the word the church doesn't appear anywhere. It's the church in Philadelphia, the church in Ephesus. Right. The right, general right. church doesn't appear Specific, there. Yeah. And if if the chapters four through 19 have to uh, deal with Israel, then why is it that Israel doesn't appear in there appear but one time mm. in chapters four wow. through 19? And I think not until chapter seven. And then the other problem is, is, is that the chapters four through 19 are supposed to be about the seven year tribulation period. Well, the, you know, the, the, the problem with that is the phrase seven years doesn't appear in the book of Revelation. Mm. The, the, the word wow. Antichrist doesn't appear in the book of Revelation. <sighs> <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, there is, you're right. I mean, there's so much when you start, uh, I mean, even, even as a, I mean, I was saved in a, in a church that was actually John MacArthur was youth pastor there a long, 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 long time ago. Is actually his father started the church. Um, and so it was loosely affiliated before he was, you know, MacArthur, MacArthur, um, but had a lot of influence. I'm very thankful for it, but it's very sure. prevalent in California. Sure. Uh, and actually David Jeremiah is also in California along with Chuck Smith. He's in San Diego. Uh, El Cal- that's right. San Diego, not Nashville. Uh, and so that's what I was talking about. There's a lot of California just, you know, we're a little, we're a little Looney Tunes out there. Um, but I, I'm thankful for it, but I never, I was never exposed to anything else. It was like post millennial. Well, that doesn't make any sense because there's a millennial kingdom, and I, I believe the Bible. I'm literal, and pre millennial or a millennial. Like, well, why would you not think there's a millennium? There's a millennium here, so I guess I'm pre millennial. Like, there's these kind of like straw manish arguments, whether they're intentional or not. But those who say, well, I'm a Bible believer, I'm a literal, I believe the Bible literally. I, I you know, a literal Genesis, a literal Revelation, a literal this. It's like I'm thankful for all that. But then you're like, but most of this stuff, you're just, you're piecemealing. Like, we don't do this when we go look at Exodus or, or Genesis or even Acts or Matthew or Rome, whatever. Like, we say, what's going in the context? What's the near context? What's the, I mean, I like to call it the authorial context of the author yeah. writing other things. And then where is it used in the rest of the Bible? And you branch out kind of like, you know, rings in a pond. And yet we're like over here in Daniel and over here. And well, you know, Antichrist, it's not really here, but man of perdition and man of lawlessness and son of perdition or whatever. And this and, and you're like, huh? I mean, I guess it's because they write all the books and people just kind of gloss it over in their mind, I guess. But I mean, like you're saying, it just makes so much more sense what the context is. I mean, even First Thessalonians 4, it's unbelievable. You know, he goes on. Right, do this. We declare the word, and then he says, verse seventeen: "Those who are alive or left be caught up together with him in the clouds." And then eighteen: "Therefore, encourage one another with these words." Yeah, well, <laughs> and read know. the re- read the rest of it. What does it say? 
um, once before, you're caught, once you're once you're caught up, you will be what together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So you will always be with. The oh, Lord. What's it say? Always. Yeah. Always. Well, that's not the pre-trib. That's not the pre the, the, the pre-trib view. The pre-trib yeah. view is is that the church comes back at right. the end of the seven year. That period. always confused me. Yeah. So, you're like, it's... What, so what's so th this is this is being seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Mm. This is this is very similar to um, Ephesians chapter two. Uh, you know, some even make the case uh, where you know there's the the uh, uh, authors the authors position in theirs. What is it? What, what's what's the authors? The first person plural. Mm -hmm. We we who are alive. Mm, yeah. And so Paul is, and you know, some have argued. Well, look, Paul. This is. Paul was including himself in, in, in this. So, but what you don't what you don't find here is you just don't find all of the elements that constitute a pre-tribulational rapture. And the and the the other problem is is that Paul never made this distinction between Israel and the church. Mm. Yes, Israel is Israel, but not every Israelite is a believer. It's always the remnant, and the the nations are the nations. And yet there is a remnant among the nations. The, the ecclesia sits in the middle of those things because you have Jews that, um, the believing Jews enter an already existing body of believers extending all the way back to the old, old covenant. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't see what was happening as being something new. They saw it as a being, being a fulfillment of the promises. That's what the book of Acts is all about. That's what Peter keeps saying. This is a fulfillment of the promises, mm. but what the what the many of the Jews didn't like is that the Gentiles were grafted in to them, and that they they also participated in all those promises. Mm. They a lot of these these the Judaizers wanted to keep the idea that the Jews have their own special relationship with God. And the and the and the Gentiles or the nations have their own special relationship with God. Both are Christians, but they're not one new man in Christ. Hmm. And and so that's kind of like dispensationalism. And it's a fault. It's a fault. It was a false doctrine then. It's a false doctrine now. Yeah, yeah. I often thought that even in kind of in that camp, and I was able to go to Israel a few years ago uh, through. It was a kind of scholarship through the seminary, um, a ministry called Passages. And um, for lack of a better word, they're, I, I guess they're dispensational loosely. And there's a lot of like national Israel and I'm all, I'm all for Israel. They should be able to have their I, land. Yeah, that's, I am too. That's great. They're um, just, look, they're, they are a pagan nation like all the other pagan nations. You yeah. know, they're, they're not special in any way. They, 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 a Jew becomes special like a Gentile becomes special by embracing Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord. Just because a person is a Jew does not make them special. Yeah. All you, you have see to that do multiple times in the New Testament. All, I mean, all you have to do I is will yeah, cry out from Abraham. Go, right? Yeah, go to Arash. John chapter one. Yeah. John chapter one. It's it's not because of your nationality. It's not because of blood. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah. Uh, but people are holding out. So, well, the Jews are God's favored people. Okay. So why, if that's the case, that during this great trip, the tribulation period, does God allow two thirds of them to be slaughtered? Mm -hmm. So you're telling me that God waits two thousand years to finally, finally redeem the Jews, and He lets the ant the Antichrist, the the Antichrist, to take over during that period of time, and to allow Him to slaughter the two thirds of the Jews? I'm I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. And I mean, here's another factor in all this. Mm -hmm. Jesus gives this, this um, prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem that was going to take before their generation passed away. Because uh, the disciples asked about, you know, Jesus, hey, you just said this temple was, was going to be left to us desolate. Uh, you mean this temple right here? And Jesus said, oh, yeah, this temple right here. And it's all going to take place before this, this generation passed away. But here's the difference. Jesus warned. Jesus warned the nation that this was going to happen. They had 40 years to repent. And if they didn't repent, if they didn't repent, they could leave the city on foot 
and escape it. Mm. Uh, uh, Luke talks about when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. And what are your, what, how did, could you escape this? Mm. By, on foot, by going outside, you know, to the mountains outside of uh, Judea. That's, that's not a worldwide tribulation. That's a local tribulation. There were people who were still living in, in, in uh, homes with flat roofs. A, a cloak was was something that was important. The Sabbath was still operating. Yeah, this is that is a local judgment that God gave a warning, forty year warning to. Yeah, but you don't find dispensationalists today warning Jews who are going to Israel that two thirds of them are going to be destroyed and slaughtered. And if you read the literature of the of the dispensationalists and some same pre, and some premillennialists, they'll tell you that's exactly what's going to happen. Hmm. Wow. And yet, why aren't they warning these Jews? If we're living in the last days, why aren't they warning the Jews to get out of Israel? Yeah. Wow. That's yikes. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yikes. That, yikes is the, that's the case. yikes yeah. is the proper word. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow. Well, that's that's good. I mean, is there any other uh, place that a rapture is is mentioned or even or hinted well, the, at? The, in- the, probably John fourteen. Uh, but it, again, uh, if it talks about uh, that, I will uh, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself. Mm-hmm. You know that that could mean when you die. I'm going to come to you and receive you to myself. The claim that that's the rapture doesn't doesn't make sense because that's not something that just happens at one point in time. It happens throughout history. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we have the uh, Revelation chapter four, First Thessalonians chapter four, but all the elements uh, necessary for this to take place. You will not find those verses standing on their on their own. I give you an, here's an example. One of the big things about Daniel chapter nine verses twenty four through twenty seven that there's a gap between the sixty ninth and the seventieth week. Mm-hmm. But w- what what leads to this this secondary prophecy? What is what is Daniel doing? He's reading the 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 the, the scroll of Jeremiah. And he's he's being reminded that there's a, this was we were supposed to be in uh, in captivity for for 70, 70 years. And let's assume that they get down to the 69th year, they finally did the calculations, and people say, one more year and we're gonna be we're gonna go back to the land. And then the 70th year comes and nothing happens. Hmm. So yeah, maybe we must have miscalculated. Maybe it's one more year. And so this another year goes by, and then finally. Someone says, well, look, we need to get one of these prophets around here to find out what's going on here, because God said 70 years. And God said, oh, I didn't tell you this specifically, but I put a gap between the 69th and 70th year of the captivity. And I'm not counting the gap, the time of the gap. I'm only counting the 69 years you were in, and I'm only going to count the one more year that uh, when I finally decide to, you know, to bring you back to the land. I'm not going to count the I'm not going to count the years in between. So tell me why, when God said seventy weeks of years, He and one through seven are consecutive, and you you don't you don't find any other place in the Bible where God gives a specific number that there is a gap mm-hmm. in that number. Wow. So, but so why why use the example? of the years of seven years of captivity and all of a sudden change the way it's, it's done. Yeah. There, there isn't a gap between, let's see, it's um, how's, how's it go? I think it goes, uh, you know, the first it talks about the first seven years, the first 49 years, but there's no gap between the seventh year and the eighth year. Mm-hmm. So why would there be a gap between the 69th and the seventh year? I just think the se- the 70th week of years, the 70th year, is that the first three and a half years of that is Jesus's ministry. Mm. So Jesus's ministry is the first three and a half years of the 70th week of years, the seven years. And the next three and a half years, the gospel goes to the, the, the Gentile, it continues to go to the, um, the, 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 the Jews. Mm-hmm. 
And the promises all made to Israel are all gone. They're done. They're over with. That's the end of the 70 weeks. That's it. Mm. And now, now what we're going to see is the dismantling of the old covenant that the writer of the Hebrews says is in the process of passing away. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. Yeah. This this all makes sense. And you don't need a you don't need a book, a dictionary, a Bible commentary to do any of this. You don't need some preacher. You don't need me to tell you this. You just need to just look at the Bible and take it at face value. And by the way, people who say they interpret the Bible, they're interpreting the book of Revelation, literally. That's what I'm doing. No, you're yeah. not. The way that word is used today, you're not interpreting it literally. literally. There's a giant woman and that's, that, that's going to be standing on the, on the moon, and she has 12 stars for a crown, and she has the sun wrapped around her. Come on. You yeah. know that's a symbol. Yeah. And there's a dragon. And you have a third of the stars are being thrown down to earth. You're not interpreting that literally in the way that most people think of the word literal. Right. R.C. Sproul said that literal is defined as interpreting something in terms of its literature. Yeah. Some things are what we would call literal and some things are symbolic. There are symbols. There are figures of speech. There are all kinds of things in the Bible. Uh, the book of Revelation is filled with signs. That's exactly what's the, the word that's used in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Mm. These things are signified, signified. These things represent something. It doesn't mean these things didn't, the, the, what they represent didn't literally happen. They did. But they, those things that literally happened are, are symbolized in a way to give a a, 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 a a picture of of what what is is coming in terms of God's God's judgment upon uh, old covenant Israel that ended mm -hmm. with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD seventy. Wow, yeah, I mean, and that's and that's really yeah, somebody who wants to take the Bible literally, which is we should all do, right? Not just make it up as we go. That's, I mean, <laughs> that's exactly what you're doing, you know, and and what I'm you know seeking. To, to even further understand and not just, well, this means this. And you're like, well, but does it mean that? Or, or or should we first understand what is being written? Who, I mean, that's the thing that's bothered me for a long time is, so you're telling me that the, there were people who read John or read Revelation. John is writing to a particular people, right? It's just the, the revelation of Jesus Christ to the seven and, and like, and they're going to read a lot of this, and they're going to be like, "I don't, I don't know what it means." It probably applies to people thousands of years. Yeah, it doesn't make any no, doesn't make no any sense. Does that. Yeah, it exactly. was passed. Yeah, there were it was passed around to the seven churches. Yeah, and they weren't yeah. all reading it, thinking, "Yeah, this doesn't apply to us. You guys don't have to worry about yeah. it." Like well, it's in the future. Well, <laughs> the, yeah, the fact that there are seven churches mentioned there specifically, they knew it applied to them. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Ages. Yeah, and and. And what you what you find in like First Corinthians chapter ten, you know, Paul is saying to the, the the Corinthians, you better avoid Israel's mistakes, because mm. the same thing is going to happen to you. And this is just the same thing in, in 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 Romans chapter eleven. Hey, don't don't be don't think you're hot stuff because some branches have been broken off and other branches have been added. If, if God was willing to break off those branches, he can break you off too. And that's what those the, the seven oh. churches and the same thing and the same thing happening today. Uh, uh, you know, but so anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I deal with a lot of this in my book, Last Day's Madness, um, you know, Wars and Rumors of Wars. If you want a real short book to take you through Matthew 24, uh, the, is Jesus coming soon? But look, the book of, book of Revelation is a difficult book. Uh, some of the greatest commentators, uh, John Calvin, for instance, who, who either preached through most of the Bible, did not tackle the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. You cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the rest of the book of the Bible. And yet you go online and you'll find people who have never really done any real exegetical work. So all, all of a sudden they become experts on the book of Revelation. Right. Not because they're re they're reading it in terms of uh, the, you know, the. The, the, the newspaper. Uh, one of these days, I would like to take a kind of the sec a section of the book of Revelation, use a pseudonym, and uh, uh, and 
make it work for what's going on in the in the culture today and then reveal myself afterwards and say, <laughs> look, any, anybody can do this. But if you're constrained by the time indicators and the and the audience, you can't do that. Yeah. That's that's the whole point. You can't do that if you are if you stick to the to the uh, the, the the time indicators. Time is near. These things must shortly take place in the very first chapter of the Bible and near the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 10, it says the same thing. The time is near. Yeah. Yeah. In the last days. And I mean, Hebrews, it says in the former days and these last days, he spoke to us by his son. I mean, yeah. that we're, we're in the last days. I, I mean, I repeatedly will do that, you know, on random comments on YouTube and stuff. And people are like, it's the last days. I'm like, we've been in the last days all along. It's not new people. You know, and it's hard, but I, like you said, it's jazzy and sensational, and people love the next little tidbit of oh, juicy. Yeah. Oh, yes. this is it! Hold yeah. on, everybody! Hold on! You know. Yeah. So anyway, so, yeah. There's there's the start again. If anyone is interested, uh, I, I follow this method in my books: Last Days of Madness and Wars and Rumors of Wars. You will become a better student of the Bible with this approach. Than mm. listening to somebody getting up there and explaining what the Bible means in terms of their way of looking at it, yeah. we should be the ones. The, you know, we, the Bereans were they searched the scriptures daily to see whether the things that Paul was saying was true. Mm -hmm. I, I do the same thing. Put me to the test. Same way. Go to scripture. You know, I said there's no verse in the New Testament that says the temple is going to be rebuilt. Try to find a verse that says it. Look, even those people who claim the temple is going to be rebuilt. Admit there's no verse in the New Testament that says that. So that and their system is built upon that. And there's no verse in the Bible that says there's that the church is going to be taken off the earth either before, during, or after a seven-year period. There's no verse that specifically says that. There's no verse in the Bible that says that Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. You will not find that in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20. Mm -hmm. In fact, Revelation chapter 20, the all millennialists are correct. Revelation chapter 20 does not describe what we think is a millennium. Mm -hmm. Peace and prosperity and so forth and so on. It doesn't just, that's, that's not in there. You have to build that case from, from, from somewhere else. So anyway. Wow. Ah, such a good conversation. Well, I appreciate you, Gary. Again, thank you again. It's, I know it's a little later where you're at, but. Um, yeah. I'm 1130 you. past my bedtime. <laughs> well, I, 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 again, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and we'll probably have to, if I can coax you into do it again, maybe at an earlier time, like we did last time. So yeah. anyway, have a good night. All and, right. Uh, thanks. Sounds yeah. good. Thank right. you. See you. Bye, Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. That was wonderful. Um, go ahead and like, and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Uh, great conversation with Gary DeMar. Go ahead and like his content. He's got a blog cast where it's just audio on YouTube. He's also uh, got a podcast on just kind of daily worldview stuff on Apple iTunes or what is it? Apple Music now. I don't know whatever it's called. And uh, I think Spotify and a few other places as well. AmericanVision.org is his website. He's the president of that ministry. It's a Christian worldview ministry. It's not just about end times, eschatological stuff but just a, an American vision, right? And not necessarily in the, you know, America's great in, in its own sense, but saying this is what America should do um, and has, you know, family structure, church structure, and, and just having a solid biblical foundation for understanding uh, the world around us. So go ahead and check out his books. Last Day's Madness was one that was mentioned. Uh, the, the, what's the other one? The, um, Fig Leaf Generation, I think, is another one as well. He mentioned Ken Gentry. Uh, Greg Bonson was also mentioned. There's several other names in there that are very worth your time. Both on YouTube, uh, you can just search their names and just look up some content or uh, books and lectures and stuff. And you can find a lot of their stuff actually on uh, Canon Press has a, an app. It's a, like $7, $8 a month. But basically, you're helping build their media uh, empire, as it were, because big tech will crack down and has cracked down on uh, on Canon Press and their content. So they have their own app that they can produce still uh, media. So you're basically helping them. I, su I subscribe to that. It's really good. But you can find a lot of Gary DeMar and Greg Bonson and several others as well on that.
app. So go ahead and check that out as well. Till next time, I'm helping you be against the world for the sake of the world.